So what are you resolved to do this year? And how do we take those resolutions, those things that are very important to us or the things that we feel drawn to do, how do we take those and actually get there? How do we take those resolutions and make them a reality in our lives where we can actually, a year from now, look back and go, everything that I set out to do, uh, that's been accomplished. You know, millions and millions of people over the last couple of weeks have made resolutions Uh, In fact, the research tells us that 40 to 45 percent of American adults, they make at least one resolution, uh, but also research tells us most people fail. Now, the truth is that you're more likely to succeed if you resolve to do something than if you didn't. But the truth is it's difficult to follow through and to accomplish those things, whether they're physical or spiritual. And I'll tell you, both are important. The physical things that we resolve to do are important to us. They should be. And all those things that we talk about, like, well, I want to lose some weight and go to the gym and watch less TV and, you know, those kinds of things, those are important. In fact, the reality is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see that there's a physical aspect to this that we do need to see and focus on. We have a slide that we'll put up that says 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, that gives us this idea. And basically what that passage tells us is that it's in our body we want to glorify God. That everything in our body. Why? It's because that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit resides in us if we're believers. And that's a promise, by the way, that if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit indwells you. That you have the Holy Spirit in you. This is, again, a promise from God where he puts a part of himself in you to guide you and direct you and to comfort you and strengthen you, remind you convict you when you go the wrong way and those kinds of things. And so we want to take care of this body because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. We want to be careful of what we see and what we allow in, what we hear and allow in, and all of those things. That's important that we take care of this from a physical perspective, but also the spiritual. We don't want to forget that. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we get this picture as well. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 8, it says bodily discipline. Now, bodily discipline in Greek, the original language here is gymnasia, which is where we get the word gymnasium from. That's good. And so basically it says bodily discipline or going to the gym is only of little profit. Let's stop there for a second and make sure that we get this straight. What this is saying is that it only benefits you a little bit if you go to the gym. And so if you want out of the gym, then this is your biblical rationale right here. I even put on here, you should probably post this on social media for all of your friends that are going to the gym. It just helps you a little bit. That's a joke, but of course, it's right there in the Bible. Why is it saying it? It is important, and we just talked about that, but it's only of a little bit of benefit. Godliness, on the other hand, that is devotion to God, righteousness, that's profitable for everything. That that spiritual aspect of following after God and chasing after God to make him the most important thing, to be fully devoted, this is profitable for all things because it holds the promise of present life and the future. That in this, in godliness and striving to be like Jesus, this is where our promise comes for now and later. This is where we live out in this day and where we will live for eternity. And so, yes, the gym is important, but only a little bit in comparison to this idea of godliness. And so last week, we began talking about this. Last week, we began to chew through this, and we were asking the question, though, how do we turn resolutions into realities? Can we find anything in Scripture that will help us with that? And of course, the answer is absolutely. Paul talks about it, I think, in Philippians chapter 3. Now, he's not maybe talking about a New Year's resolution. I don't think that he is, but we can see what Paul is talking about in our devotion, and how are we devoted, and how do we focus our lives, and how do we move forward out of wherever we've been. And so we started that last time. And the first two things that we see in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 are these, and there are five of them, and we'll finish that today. But where we started was to frankly confess your shortcomings. This is what verse 12 says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. Paul knows that he's not perfect. Paul knows that he is a work in progress. Anybody want to admit that you are a work in progress? Anybody? That should be all of us. I know it's scared to raise your hand at church, like I'm going to con- you know, tell you, okay, now that your hands are up, this is what you do. No, not that. It's just we're a work in progress. It's safe. How about you? Okay, let's try it again. How many of you are a work in progress? 
See how easy that is? It's just like that. Boom, right there. And so this is what Paul is saying. Part of what Paul's saying is, I'm a work in progress, haven't obtained it yet. What is it? Well, he tells us in verse 10, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, conformed to his death. That I may know him. I want to know Jesus fully and completely. This is part of what Paul's saying. And, I, and Paul's saying, I, I haven't gotten there yet. To be able to confess our shortcomings. That we haven't succeeded completely. We have a lot to learn. Now, do we want to learn from that? Do we want to learn from our past mistakes and all those things? Of course we do. But to be able to confess our shortcomings. I haven't made it yet. And then from there, Paul says, now, but become fully devoted. That is... To press on is actually what he says. He says it here again in verse 12. Not that I've already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I press on. And we get this idea from the original language. This is the energetic, aggressive nature of a sprinter who presses on, strains every muscle, every, every bit of their lives in order to reach the finish line. This is... This is the picture of being devoted to this and pressing on to be all in. Now, the call to action, though, for us last week, at the conclusion of that, it was really simply just to pray. And I asked you to pray throughout the week. And to pray in particular that God would show you and me that we pray this together, but individually, that God would show you what he wants to do in you this year. I think resolutions are good. I think they're important. If you don't make them, it doesn't, you know, whatever. But I think ultimately one of the reasons that our resolutions don't work is we just do whatever seems right in our flesh. Like, well, I just want to lose some weight. And so, boy, I should try it again. Like I did last year and the year before and the 20 years before that. You know, those kinds of things. And then we just live out the definition of an insanity. Anybody know the definition of insanity? We just do the same thing over and over and over, expecting somehow, someday, it will miraculously be different. And that's just not how it usually works, is it? And so instead of all of that, to ask God, what do you want to do in me? Rather than me deciding in my flesh what I want, to be surrendered enough to say, okay, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do in me this year? This time next year, how do you want me different than I am right now? This is important. This is important that we get into this place because the truth is, I don't think this is just a prayer for today. I don't think it's a prayer for last week. I don't think it's a once a year resolution making prayer. I think it is an every day throw the covers over, get out of bed kind of prayer. That every day, every moment I should be in this place of saying, God, I'm surrendered enough to say, what do you want to do with me today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? What do you need me to accomplish for you? Because I'm all in. I'm surrendered. Whatever you want, my day is yours. And that's hard to do sometimes. It's hard to do every day sometimes, especially. But this is where it begins, this life that Paul's talking about to be fully devoted to. To say, God, what do you want to do today? And so this is what I challenged you with this past week. How, God, do you want me to live the life that's worthy of the calling of my life. And we all have to hear that and ask God, what, how do I do it? How do I live a life worthy? Worthy of you. Worthy of the calling. Now part of this, uh, this past week, I mailed a lot of you something. Uh, this time last year, I was laying out for you the theme of 2015. And the theme for 2015 was to grow. It was to mature and to develop spiritually. And so about this time last year then, part of the invitation of one of the sermons was, now I want you to go and basically get a note card from one of the tables around the room, and I'd like for you to write down how you want to grow this year, and then put it in an envelope, put your address on it, and then we'll pray over it, and we'll mail it to you at the end of the year, and here we are. And so this past week, we mailed those. By the way, we prayed for them consistently and constantly all year long as a staff, and as a team. They were prayed over at least once a week, sometimes three, four, five, six times. We didn't know what they said. We had a wicker basket full of all these and we just prayed over them and prayed, God, move in the hearts of the people that put a card in this thing and help them to grow in the way that they want to grow. And a lot of you got those cards in the mail and there were probably some exciting cards to receive and there were others that were probably very discouraging and, and hurtful in a sense to see if I didn't accomplish what I hoped to accomplish. And for those of you that weren't here, and what I said last week was, um, at least look at your life and say, where did I want to be right now a year ago? 
a year ago when I was resolving to be different and to grow in some way, did you get there? Did you accomplish what it was that you felt like you needed to do and how you wanted to grow? And although I think it's useful to look at the past in context of my present, in other words, to look back there and say, where have I been and where am I now? Doing that is a painful exercise at times. Would you agree with that? When we look back at where we've been, sometimes we're not very happy with where we are now and how that's affected us and how it's influenced. Sometimes our past can haunt us and cripple us. And sometimes if we focus too much on the past, it affects our ability to live and to move forward because we're stuck back there somewhere for whatever reason. Whatever the barrier is, whatever it is, sometimes will just cripple us. And sometimes it's not always the bad things that do it. Sometimes it's good things from the past that cripple us and keep us from moving forward. Sometimes it's the good things that we get stuck in. And so helping us to grow and to live and to become the men and women that God calls us to, part of that journey is to actually forget the past. This is the third thing that we see in Philippians chapter 3. When Paul talks about frankly confessing and being fully devoted, but also to forget the past, that's what he says right here in 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it. What is that again? That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, that I will know Jesus, those things. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind and keeping focused on the future. To reach forward to what lies ahead, to forget the past. Now, Here's the thing. A lot of the times we don't want to forget the past. There are good things in the past. We don't want to forget people from our past. And, and that's not what forget means in this context. Forget the past does not mean we erase every memory that we've ever had. It doesn't mean that. I want to remember when my babies were little and when they couldn't talk back. Those are important times for me. You know, I, I cherish those. I want to remember that time. So I'm, when Paul says forget the past, he doesn't mean erase every memory. What Paul is saying to forget the past is don't let the past have power over you anymore. Don't allow the past to cripple you. Don't allow the past to influence your future. Don't be affected by it. Now again, we need to learn from the past, but not be crippled by the past. That's the trick. How do we move forward? And here's the deal. you got to hear this. Your future is not dependent on where you've been. No matter whether your past was beautiful or terrible, your future is not dependent on that. Your present is not dependent on that. And God wants you to hear that, and so does Paul. Now, I will tell you, I think it's easy to get stuck in the good things of the past at times. That we rest on the past, that we look at it and we go, you know, this is good enough. I've made it. I just want to hold on until Jesus comes now. I've accomplished what I need to accomplish. And sometimes those past successes can cripple us individually and as a church. Like as a church, I think there are times we can look back and go, man, the history of Renew has been great. Uh, there's so much to celebrate and so much to look at and go, wow, this is great. Now let's just be the best church of whatever that we can be. We could do that and get stuck back there. Lots of churches do. And they look at their past and they go, well, yeah, we've accomplished some stuff and we're just really happy with that. But I will tell you, our best days are not behind us as a church. As beautiful as the story is, our best days are still ahead. And I think that's true for you too. That our best days are still ahead of us. So our, success, our successes can mess us up if we let them, to, let them do that. But also our failures. That when we look back and we look at our past failures, we hear the message often that you're not good enough that you're disqualified because of wherever you've been or how many terrible things you've done. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that message, but I certainly have. I've heard it many times in my life. And in fact, today, as the third service, as people left after both services, one of the consistent messages of feedback I heard today was, I've been in that place where my past felt like disqualification for my future. That I'd gone so far and done so many terrible things that I was disqualified from really being a man or woman after God's own heart. And you know, if anyone had the right to feel that way, it's Paul. And now you may not know Paul, but if you get to know Paul, you'll find that Paul has a rather intriguing story. And if anyone had right to think that his past successes or failures disqualified him from moving forward, it would have been him. And Paul, as you get to know him, you find out he's like sort of the super Christian and super apostle in that sense. But 
what you find is that before his moment of literally coming to Jesus on the road to Damascus, sort of that you know, face-to-face moment of the, oh, hello, this is you kind of thing. Before he has this literal come to Jesus moment, he was the persecutor of the church. It was his main mission in life to lock people like you up and throw you in prison or maybe even to stand by and watch you killed. This was Paul. This is who he was. Do you think the devil ever got into Paul's head and said, think about what you've done, Paul. You have no right to tell people about Jesus. You think the devil would do that to Paul? With that kind of history, if you had that history, do you think the devil could get in there and go, you have no right. You have no right. You are disqualified. The past is simply too much. Again, I've heard those messages, and you probably have too. I've told you before, (laughs) it was devastating. Years and years ago, I wasn't a Christian until I was about 21. And years ago in the church that I pastored before we planted this church, uh, a friend of mine who we used to party with and caused all kinds of trouble, um, he came to our church one day and sat and listened and afterwards said to me, I cannot listen to you tell me about Jesus knowing the things we used to do. It was that moment where the devil says, boom, there you go. See, you have no right to tell people about Jesus. In fact, it's quite the opposite. That when you've been on the other side and you experience redemption and restoration and renewal. This is the story. This is how Paul certainly tells the story. He wasn't disqualified because of his past terrible things, but also because of his good things. And in fact, in Philippians 3, and we mentioned it last week, he gives a spiritual pedigree. And he talks about all the amazing things that he had accomplished in Israel and all the stuff in his life. And he certainly could have gotten stuck there and used this as the moment to say, look, I've really arrived. I've really accomplished everything that I need to accomplish. But he doesn't go there either. He doesn't get stuck there. Paul didn't allow his past, whether it was good or bad, to wreck his future. He knew that he was called to something important. No matter whether it was a great accomplishment or a great failure, that God could take all of that and work it out. But what he needed to do was be able to forget that and not be influenced by any of those things so that he could move forward. And that's the message for you and me. It is the message for us. It is the message for the church. It means that the bad things in your past, and we all have them, Every one of us in the room has terrible things in our past if we're honest with ourselves. Am I right? That means then when we come to grips with that to allow Jesus to heal you from those things. That if you will follow Jesus, his, part of his promise is that he can make you clean and wash you clean. That Not that those things didn't happen, but... He can redeem those and restore you and give you a new life to live, a new journey. This is a beautiful picture of redemption that no other religion could ever even begin to imagine. It's only in Christianity that we see this picture that God's willing to take on flesh and give you a new life to make all the terribleness of the past come together for good and to work it out and to give you a new start. It's only in Jesus that we get that. This is a beautiful picture. And so what you need to hear is that you are not too bad. You are not damaged goods. Even though I know the devil tells some of you that all the time. That you're not damaged goods and God can still use you and wants to. And has called you. The question is, will you live the life worthy of that calling? And that's what we're working through this year. But part of it begins here that we have to work past that past stuff. And by the way, again, it's not just the bad, but even in the good things. To not get so hung up on all the good things that we've accomplished that we just go, you know what, I'm just going to coast from here on out. I've got my ticket punched, I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm just going to wait it out because someday I'll get there. And between now and then, I'm just going to try and keep my nose clean and stay out of trouble. And so many people get stuck there too. And that's a sad thing. Should we celebrate the beautiful things from the past? Should we celebrate what God has done in us and in this church? Of course we should. But we can't ever get to a point where we go, you know what, we've arrived and we're just going to coast from here on out. This is not at all what Paul thought and not at all what the picture of Christianity is. You know, if we stop dreaming of a better 
reality because of what God can do in the city or what God can do in your homes or in your workplace or school, if we stop dreaming of what God will do next, we are dying. And so often we get stuck and complacent to just go, I'm just going to coast it from here. But that's just a story of death. Instead, to be willing to fail while reaching for the impossible that God has planned for us rather than to succeed, settling for less. I, we could very easily here at Renew go, you know, let's set some really easily obtainable goals for ourselves. Let's just make sure that we get, I don't know, how about 25 new visiting families this year? That sounds really exciting. Let's just set that goal and then we'll celebrate it when we get there. Guess what? We will have 25 visiting families next month. And so why set a goal that we know we can accomplish in our flesh? Wouldn't it be better to be so dependent on God that says, God, what do you want to do in this place? And let it be so big that it's beyond our ability to control it out of our flesh. But that we have to be so dependent on you because we believe that you are still a God of great things. This is how we don't get stuck in the past. And we can turn those resolutions into realities despite where we've been. Just like the sprinter doesn't look backwards. Sprinters don't look backwards, you know. They don't look back because if you look back, you slow down. They don't focus on where they've been, but they focus on the goal ahead. This is what Paul's saying. And that focus is so important. I think this is, by the way, part of why God gives us eyes in the front of our head, not behind. It is to keep us focused on where we're going. Can you imagine how different life would be if we had eyes back here? We would be constantly focused on what? Where we've been. And we would lose track and focus of where we're supposed to go. But here, we keep our focus on where we need to go and what we need to accomplish and what God wants to do in us. And this leads us to the fourth thing that Paul really talks about, and that is to focus your aim. This is what we see in this passage, again, back to 13. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, and I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love what Paul says here, that I'm going to focus my aim. It is the one thing that I do. The one thing. Paul is so focused. And I think for us, it's easy to get distracted into a million little things. That we do a little bit of everything, or maybe we do a little bit of the wrong thing, but do we ever focus on the thing? And really strive for that one thing. This is what Paul's talking about. Paul says there's one thing for us to focus on. There's really one thing to be fully resolved to accomplish. To be fully devoted to. Not 20 things. And for Paul this focus is very clear. Everything else is secondary. Everything else beyond this one thing is a secondary issue. But how about us? Do we take Paul's lead on this? Or are there 5, 10, 20, 30 different things that we're constantly juggling in our life that we think are important? Or is there just really one thing that we're really resolved to? One thing that we're really focused on? You know, I don't know if you remember this analogy, but... Sometime recently, we talked about this very thing, and it's a message that needs to come back all the time, that in our lives, we're constantly juggling, right? It's like we have 20 different balls in the air all the time, and sometimes when we find Jesus, he just becomes another one of the balls that we put into the mix. And Jesus and the church just becomes one more thing that we juggle, and it's no harder or no easier to get rid of Jesus than it is watching TV, and he just becomes one more thing that we juggle. And instead, what Paul is saying is don't let Jesus just be one more thing. Let Jesus be the thing and everything else is in him. And just one thing, not a thing. This is what Paul is saying to us. That my focus is the one thing. And that one thing is Jesus, to be totally resolved to that and to forcibly pursue that. To be purposeful and pursue it. That's the fifth thing that Paul tells us in Philippians 3. Forcefully or forcibly pursue your goal. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is 
absolutely determined to do this. Paul is absolutely determined to succeed, to press on to the goal, to win the prize. And what is the goal? Again, I think if we don't know what the goal is, we will never run the right race. We will run here and there and everywhere if we are focused on 20 things. And Paul is saying there is one thing that we need to be focused on. If we're running the race and it's like sprinting a marathon, that's how life goes. Would you agree with that? It's like sprinting the marathon. But the one thing where we keep our eyes focused, the finish line, where it is, Paul is super abundantly clear that it is to be more like Christ in the here and now. In the here and now, to begin living that life where we look more and more like Jesus every day and that ultimately, the ultimate prize is Christ-likeness in heaven. That there will be one day that we will truly be like Jesus. And we see this picture in verse 20 and 21 here. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord. There's our Lord word, Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself, to bring all things under the feet of Jesus, where Jesus isn't just one of many things, but he is the thing and everything else is subject to him. This is what Paul says that our focus needs to be. And I'll tell you, I get the sense from Paul that nothing's going to stand in his way. That being shipwrecked, that's not going to stand in the way. The devil tried to mess him up lots of times. Being beaten to an inch of his life, within an inch of his life, that wasn't going to stop him. Being bitten by poisonous snakes, that's not going to stop him. How about in our lives, if we were to put ourselves in the place of Paul for a moment, do you think those things would wreck us? Would the same things that did not wreck Paul, would they wreck us? I mean, when you start to look at this verse 10 again, where he says, not that I've already obtained it, what is the it? Verse 10 says that I may know him. That is not just, I have more intellectual knowledge, but I know him intimately that I really know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Ooh, it's, there's usually not a lot of suffering involved in Christianity in America today. Now, there may be a little bit now, but ultimately there are people all around the world today who are losing their life because of Jesus. You know, that's true, right? But here, not so much. Not, it's not likely anyway. It may be a little bit here and there, little pockets. But, but if we were really to know the fellowship of his sufferings, in other words, if we were to walk into the same thing that Paul walked into, or ultimately Jesus, would we persevere? Would we be able to hang on because we know the prize at the end? Whether we live or we die, would we be able to continue the journey and follow This is an important question for us. And I think Paul brings us to this place, but nothing stands in his way. But what stands in our way of being fully devoted? I mean, would shipwrecks or being beaten or bitten by snakes, would those, how about less things? Like would cold weather stop us from pursuing Jesus? It stops a lot of people. It does. Or how about um, staying up late or... Um, there's a game on, or whatever. What are the things that prevent us from continuing to follow, that distract us and sidetrack us from seeing the goal and finishing well? And what Paul says is you've got to focus your aim and look past the junk that stands in the way. This is what Paul's saying. This is at least part of it, to forcefully pursue the goal. Nothing was standing in his way. He was determined to finish well. And Paul talks about this throughout Scripture, to run the race and finish well. I want to finish well. I'm guessing I have a few more years in me. Who knows, though? Who knows? We never know. But if it's many more years, I want to finish well. I want you to finish well. But to finish well, we've got to keep our eye on the finish line. And that doesn't mean, look, heaven's waiting, so I'm just going to coast from here on out. We've already talked about that today. But instead, salvation hangs in the balance, and there are thousands of people that need to know Jesus that are around me. 
In the meantime, I want to tell them that, but I want to grow and mature and live the life worthy of the calling that Jesus has called us to. This is our theme for 2016, Ephesians 4.1. To live the life worthy. So what? Why is this important? Well, let me ask you, do you think we can learn anything from Paul? from these five things that he lays out for us, for us in Philippians 3. Can we learn anything there? I think we can. I mean, if we were to look at our resolutions, no matter what they are, physical or spiritual, and go, look, I'm going to frankly confess my shortcomings where I haven't done it in the past, I'm going to admit it. Because when you own it, that helps us to not live in the past failures, right? You've got to own mistakes. So when you can fully confess it, fully devote yourself now to impress on, forget what's happened in the past, good or bad. I'm not going to live in the past. I'm going to look forward to the future, focus my aim, and forcefully pursue the goal. Would this help us succeed in our resolutions this year? I think the answer is yes. I think that's helpful. Maybe this will help you. But you know what? I think the most important thing that we can learn from Paul is not a process, a five-step process for turning resolutions into realities. You know why? Because you probably won't remember the five. Now, you can go back to Philippians 3, 12 through 14 and remind yourself of those, but we probably won't remember those processes unless we write it down and really focus on it and maybe put it on our mirror or whatever. I think it's beyond just what we learn as a process from Paul, but more so what he was resolved to do himself, and that is just simply to be more like Jesus and to live every day with every breath, with every heartbeat to live a life worthy of the calling, to look more and more like Jesus every day. This is the resolution that really means something. And so where do we go from here? What do we do with all this? Well, let me just ask you, and I'm not going to put you on the spot. You don't have to raise your hand again. Is that fair? (laughs) So that's good. But can we be resolved in this together? Resolved in this individually, but also as the body of Christ. That's what the church is, the, the body of Christ. With him as the head. Could we be resolved to this kind of thing, what Paul lays out for us? Can this be something that we are resolved to, that we focus this way all year to be more like Jesus and live that life worthy of the calling that he's given us, to really live? What would it look like if we together, the 900 or so people that call Renew their church, what if every one of us said, we are devoted to living a life worthy of the calling that we've been called to. Would it change anything? I think it would change everything. Everything. So what would it look like then if we could come together and begin to confess our shortcomings, even as a church, to go, you know what, we haven't arrived Guess what? I can confess that right now to you. As a church, we haven't arrived. There's much more to do. There's much more to accomplish. And we could look at physical things like it'd sure be nice to not have the roof leak right there and there when it rains. Like we've got some room to grow in some areas, you know, those kinds of things. But not to stop there, but as a church body and reaching the lost people and the hungry people and the broken people of our city, is there more to do? Of course there is. Have we accomplished it yet? No, we're a work in progress and always will be as a church. Because the moment that we say, hey, we're good, we're going to coast, we've accomplished everything we can, we're dying. And so have we reached it? No, we haven't attained it yet. We have more work to do to confess our shortcomings. What if we did that, though, together? To really confess our shortcomings, to be aggressive and not apathetic and complacent. You know, apathy and complacency is the murderer of everything. Apathy and complacency will kill your marriages. Apathy and complacency will make your children hate you. Apathy and complacency will destroy the ability to get an education. Apathy and complacency will get you fired. Apathy and complacency will keep the lost people that live within 30 seconds of this building from hearing the good news of Jesus and finding community. Apathy and complacency will keep you from building lifelong relationships with other people here that can support you and strengthen you when you're broken and hurting. Apathy and complacency will kill this church and every church. That's what apathy does. 
apathy and complacency in our devotion to be aggressive, to fight it. And I can't fight that battle for you. I have to fight my own battles. There are days that it's not easy. And it's like, I just want to be apathetic today. There are moments for every one of us, including me. But fighting that and having people surrounding us that can help us to overcome that apathy and complacency so we don't take a nosedive. How about together we forget the past? Again, our past failures, have we had them? Sure. And where we failed God, repent. Quit doing that and turn around and go God's way. This is an important message that the church in America needs to hear that it's not just about God will forgive you no matter what. It is that story, but it begins with your repentance to say, I'm done doing it my way. I'm going to turn around and go God's way. This is an important message the church in America has missed because it's not very touchy-feely and good to, that says, no, to follow Jesus and to finish well, it means stop doing the stupid things that you're doing, me stop doing the terrible things, and to focus on doing what God calls us to do, to live a life worthy of the calling that he's given us. To forget, though, those past things, to allow ourselves to repent and be forgiven and move forward, but also not to allow the past successes to keep us apathetic and complacent, but to move past those things, to singularly focus our hearts and our minds and our actions and our ministry on Jesus. That doesn't mean we can't have fun together. We should. We should get together and have fun. Do you agree with that? I think the church should have fun together. I think this is a part of what you even see in the early church. I'm convinced that when they got together and they fellowshiped and they ate together, they enjoyed being in each other's presence. We can do that. We can have fun together. But it's not just about having a party and the best parties in town. Can you have a party and invite your lost friends to the party? Absolutely. Should you? Yeah. Matthew does that, by the way. When Matthew comes to Jesus, Matthew the tax collector, the worst guy in the city, guess what? He throws a party. And he invites all of his loser friends and the guest of honor is Jesus. Can we have a good party and invite our loser friends so that when they get here, they meet Jesus? Yes, as long as they meet Jesus. And so this is part of our life. This is part of our heart and our mind and our action, our ministry. And lastly, together, to be resolved not to let anything stand in the way of this goal. To not let stuff get in the way because we're juggling 30 different things in life and Jesus and church are just one more, one more thing to toil with. Forget that. If Jesus is the thing, all that other stuff is secondary. And here's the thing I will tell you also. I think that if we really could focus on letting Jesus be the thing and we spent every moment trying to let Jesus be the thing, not just a thing, all the other resolutions fall into place. Let me just say it this way. I think, I could be wrong here, but I think if we really allow Jesus to be the thing, do you think, well, let me ask it as a question. Do you think it might affect the way that you watch TV, for instance? If watching less TV or better TV is a res resolution to you, do you think if you're really truly focused on Jesus, would it affect the way you watch TV? Or the way that we eat or the way that we spend our money and time? See, that's the thing, is I think when Jesus is the thing... And everything else is subject to him. The other resolutions fall into place. It's when we take our eyes off of Jesus that we lose it and get messed up. Just like Peter. Remember Peter and the getting out of the boat? Peter gets out of the boat. If you don't know that story, you've got to go read it. Peter gets out of the boat. He walks in the water with Jesus. But he focuses on the storm and he begins to sink. But he puts his eyes back on Jesus and Jesus pulls him up. Some of you, you're sinking right now, and you need to refocus. Some of you are still in the boat, scared to death to live. Don't be afraid to get out of the boat and live. But when we live, live the life worthy of the calling, because I want to walk on the water with Jesus. I want to at least live that life, understanding that it's him ultimately that's moving us forward, and me too. That we can live that life of faith and trust, and that God can do bigger things than we can think or imagine to change the world, to change the lives around us, to change the city, to change your homes, to change your schools and our workplaces and all of it. But it, keeps, it means we've got to fix our eyes on the finish line of where we're going and then live this life worthy of that finish line. And so today the invitation is pretty simple. 
The invitation is to sit right there in your chair and to pray. I think going back to last week's prayer, God, what do you want to do in me this year? I think that's a good prayer. I think another prayer to pray is to simply say, God, help me to live a life worthy of the calling that you've given me. Show me the areas that I've put up as stumbling blocks that keep me from living this life and remove those things. God, show me the man or the woman that you want me to be. I think these are good prayers to pray now, today. God, show me what the finish line really looks like for me. And what do I need to do to follow that lead? And will you help me and show me the way? Because you're not in this journey together. Part of being here is that we're in this journey together. You're not alone. And ultimately, you're not alone because... Jesus is with you if you're a follower, if you're surrendered, if he's Lord in your life. And maybe that's the prayer for some of you. God, I have done this my own way too long, but I want you to be in charge. Maybe this is the thing that we need to pray for. And then I invite you to the cross. I do it because this is ultimately the context of what Paul is saying in verse 10, and I've read it to you several times today. But Paul's desire is that he would know Jesus, know him personally and intimately in the power of his resurrection. But we don't get resurrection without crucifixion because what you need to hear is that Jesus died to set you free. All that passed and all the junk that you brought in maybe even with you today, all that stuff, all the failure, all the brokenness, Jesus wants to heal you from these things, but it takes surrender on our part all of us, to surrender and go, I'm I'm ready for that and now to live this life. But to allow Jesus to forgive you and to ask him to do that because of what he does at the cross. And we should remember the cross and we can celebrate the cross because it's at the cross that we find freedom. The shackles of our debt of sin are broken because of the cross. All you have to do is accept that gift and then live this life. That's where it begins. And it's only because of the cross that Paul can say, I want to know the power of his resurrection, life forever. And so I want to invite you to the cross as a part of this time of invitation, which means pray and then let's share in this time of communion. To take a piece of that bread which reminds us of the body that was broken at that cross. And to take the cup which reminds us of the blood that was shed Because as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is where we begin this journey together in light of the cross, in light of the resurrection, to know him and to run this race, to finish well, to be the men and women after God's own heart, to live the life worthy of the calling that you've received. And so I'm going to ask you to pray and share in this communion. You don't have to do this, but you're invited to it. And there's stations all around the room in the front and the back. And then we'll come back together and we'll pray one more time. But you're invited into this moment with God to ask him, to be moved by him, and to share in this at the cross.